I'm starting now. All right. So, so I think the session starts from 3.35 maybe. Yeah, but I think it's good to let people in. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I see the participant number increase and even in our back room here. Yes. Okay. How exciting. It's nice to have you introduce me again. Yes, <laughs> I will do my best. Yes. I even printed it out. Oh, you did? Wow. Okay. So you're talking about having lunch. We can also meet for lunch now, well, at least outside. Outside, you know, I just heard, I don't know whether you know, there's someone I know at the university um, I won't mention who here, but there's someone I know who got a breakthrough case and lost their sense of smell. Mm. I found that out yesterday, which is concerning. I mean, that often persists. You know, if a breakthrough case is just the flu, a flu-like or a cold-like thing, that's one thing. And if it could have long-term consequences, that's another. Yes, thing. definitely. I have known people who lost yeah, still no. But in, in a breakthrough, I mean, no, I've not heard of that in a breakthrough before, right? Yeah, it's not certainly if they got it before being vaccinated. But it's anyway. Yeah, yeah. Let's see how it goes when we start classes. Yes, let's see. It's changing Coming rapidly. Uh, I don't know if there have been any um, sessions um, sessions on. Uh, 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 epidemics, COVID, COVID modeling. <laughs> in actually, this. actually, Jennifer, do you want to try share your screen? Yes, I, I tried it already okay, uh, before and it worked. I, I tried it with Naomi and Kristen. Should I try again or? Yes. Why don't you just put it up? I don't have any slides, so. Okay, good. Uh, uh, here. Uh, um, full screen? Yeah. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Great. I think they want us to start at 1.35. So we still have a couple Good. minutes. Good. Still would have been better if you were in person. Yes, definitely. I forget where this was supposed to be. <laughs> I think Seattle. Ah, well, that would have been nice. That'd be nice. Yes. Okay, we have a hundred. What is your second talk, actually? I, I was going to look it up. My second talk is, uh, let's see, I guess for the East Coast, it's four o'clock. For the West Coast, it's one o'clock on Thursday. Four o'clock. I should also remind people that, yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, if I, are most people coming in from the East Coast or what? And anyway, it's four o'clock Eastern time. Okay. One o'clock Pacific time. So you're not giving three. You're only giving two. I'm times. only giving two. I'm okay. only giving two. Yes. So Bodhi, Bodhi, how are the sessions being attended right now with the JSM? You're muted. Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I attended a couple of medallion lectures, and we had about. 150 to 200, um, closer to 150. So we have already crossed that. And I'm hoping in the next couple of minutes, a few more people will join. That's great. Good. Yeah, I was at the invited session. I had the session and it was pretty good. It was like 125, so that was pretty good. Oh, yeah. yeah. There are 4,500 um, attendees of the conference officially, I, I heard, which is wonderful. I don't know where they all are. But <laughs> I think we all got a bit Zoom fatigued. So yes. it's kind of challenging. Absolutely. To... Absolutely. Yes. But there are times you have 20 concurrent sessions. So. Yeah, I think we have more parallel sessions this year because the time you have to be both West Coast and East Coast, right? And they start quite early. Early right? for us. Yes. 7 a.m. 7 a.m. East Coast, I think, or I don't remember, but it looked no, like. I think 7, it's oh, 7 a.m. East Coast, so 4 a.m. West Coast. That's right. I was looking and thinking. No, no, no. I think 7 a.m. West Coast. I see. Okay. Okay. That's so okay. I don't think 4 a.m. will get any West Coast attendees. 
absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, so yeah, we are. Yes, so. excited. That's nice. And we're being told we're live. Yes, we're not saying anything um, that we shouldn't say. Not terrible. <laughs> yeah. I think I think actually it's time. We shall probably start. Bodhi, shall we? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Please. Okay. Welcome, everyone. It gives me my. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Jennifer Chase, whom I had known for many, many years. Jennifer, who is now Associate Provost of the new division called Division of Computing, Data Science and Society at UC Berkeley, and also the Dean of School of Information. She's also Professor of EECS, Information, Statistics and Mathematics. She had a very fast trajectory from her PhD in Princeton, graduated in 1983 in mathematical physics and became a full professor uh, in seven years. And she stayed at UCLA Mass Department for 10 more years before she moved to Microsoft and really have been co-founding three wonderful labs in uh, Cambridge, New York City, and Montreal. She's also a member of National Academy of Sciences a member of American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She has received numerous awards, including Siam's uh, highest honor called the John Von Norman Award, and also honorary degree, doctor degree from Leiden University. She's one of the inventors of the uh, graph funds I think you'll hear about today. And she also worked on machine learning for cancer, ethical decision making, and science and sustainability. So before um, she became my boss boss, that I have known uh, Jennifer for many, many years and had always been a big fan. And I think helping to bring her to Berkeley has been my best service to data science and to Berkeley. And since her arrival, like about one year and a half ago, she has been an amazing leader for the new division, CDSS, and the future college. And um, she's fearless and effective, and she has been also a compassionate friend. So Berkeley, extremely fortunate to have her here, and myself included. And Jennifer, please take it away. And her second talk is on Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. So please join us also for that talk. Jennifer. Hey, thank you so much, Ben, for the, for the wonderful introduction. I just want to say it has been my privilege to be Ben's friend for many, many years. And uh, one of the things that attracted me to Berkeley was Ben and a few other oh. really amazing colleagues. No, she is, she is one of the reasons that I came to Berkeley. And what we are building together here is amazing and will be even more amazing. So uh, some of you maybe can take a look at what we're doing in Berkeley Computing Data Science and Society. Okay, so I'm going to be giving two lectures on modeling and estimating large sparse networks. And this is about graphons, which Ben mentioned I was one of the co-inventors of about, I guess now it's 16 years ago. So uh, what was, oh my, um, why is this not, this is not, okay, well, I can just hit the screen like that. Um, so there are three related problems that we were thinking of 15 or 16 years ago. Um, one was, what is the correct notion of a limit of graphs? Okay, we know that limits of interacting particle systems or differential equations. We, we know that our limit of statistical physics is thermodynamics. So, you know, what is a way of getting a limit which preserves essential properties of the finite graphs in the sequence, but not too much? If I came up with a very, very, very strong notion of a limit, then everything would converge to something different. It wouldn't be a help at all. And if I came up with a very, very, very weak notion, everything would converge to the same point. Maybe trivial, maybe not, but also not very interesting. And we're especially interested 
in this for sparse graphs of unbounded degree, like the kinds of things we see in the world, power law graphs, social networks. You know, there are many sparse graphs of unbounded degree. And the second question is, how do I non-parametrically model large scale real world networks? And then how do I, and, and there have been a lot of parametric modeling, but you know, when we get really large scale, sometimes it's much better to have a non-parametric model. And then how do I estimate or learn this non-parametric representation from data? If I have the data of the Facebook graph, okay, how do I learn the non-parametric representation of that in terms of graphons, which you're about to learn about? And then can we use graph limits to construct algorithms on networks? For example, if I take a very sparse sample of a denser underlying network, so let's think about the Facebook graph, okay? So no, let's think about the Netflix graph. So I have people and I have movies. And really, latently, there is an underlying dense network. I could be rating every movie, but of course, I don't. So what I'm seeing then, and what Netflix is seeing, is a very sparse sample of a dense underlying network. And what they want to do is they want to predict unobserved properties of this network, in a sense, and recommend to me what would be a movie that I would like. And I might want to also do this for like if a um, uh, if a development economist is working in sparsely samples of population, how can they infer things from this sparse sample of a dense underlying network? Okay, so this is kind of the overview of graphs and graphons. What are graphs? They're vertices and edges. Let's represent the edges, and I'm going to be talking about undirected graphs. Um, Let's represent the edges as an adjacency matrix. So this is a matrix that has, if I have n vertices, it has you know, these, these n points down one side, n points uh, along the other side. And I put a one in the adjacency matrix if the edge is there. And I put a zero if it's not there. So the adjacency matrix is the full set of edges. Code that is a code for the full set of edges. And what graphons are going to be, the vertex set is going to be replaced by a sigma finite measure space. So you can think of the points, it becomes a continuum of points as sitting in, um, as sitting in omega. F is the sigma algebra, and I have a measure on set. And then instead of edges, I'm going to have a symmetric measurable function, W sitting on omega cross omega. I'm going to take limits. I'm going to show you different kinds of limits for graphs with different properties. Then I'm going to say if I'm given one of these graphons, which is basically this function W, how do I non-parametrically generate random graphs so that I can get realizations of graphs consistent with this. And finally, if I observe a graph, the Facebook graph, the Netflix graph, how do I estimate this function W that in some way characterizes that graph? Plus, I'll show you an application. So this all began with Dan Jennifer, sorry, yeah. Jennifer, there's a question about that. Is V always a finite set? Um, v, it, what, it's going to tend to infinity, and that's how we're going to get. So when we think of the graph, it's a finite set. But we're going to take that size of V to infinity in defining the graph. One. Okay, so we think about the sequence V is finite, but then in the limit, it it tends to infinity. I mean, the size of V is finite. So the easiest case is the case of dense graphs. Okay, these are graphs in which um, any element is connected on average to a positive fraction of other elements in the graph. Okay, so n points I have of order n squared edges, not all of them, but you know, I'm, so this is a much easier case 
Um, in statistical physics, it's like a mean field model, but this is a much easier case because there, um, the way you have to scale it naturally leads to non-trivial limits. Uh, sparse graphs are much, much more difficult, and we're going to spend most of our time on that. We're also going to do non-parametric graph modeling. We're going to review, you know, like the um, uh, certain kinds of very well-known parametric ways, and then say, how do we get something non-parametric? Then, um, how do I estimate and predict things about a network? So that'll be the fourth thing we talk about. And then we'll talk about an algorithm that's basically like, how do I get, um, how do I do an algorithm on the Netflix graph or on the graph on the Netflix graph that allows me in the same way as if you look at a differential equation, you can often get to behavior much more easily than if you look at the interacting particle system, you're going to be able to look at the graph on and get to, to behaviors more, more quickly. Continuum objects are often easier to deal with. So we can do algorithms on those continuum objects. Okay, so this is just a picture, but it's giving you a heuristic on what we're doing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a graph and I'm going to look at the adjacency matrix and I'm going to color the ones black and the zeros and, and, the, and the unoccupied edges, um, the zeros white. And then I'm going to take the limit in a very heuristic way. So if I have a half graph, there are how many? There are seven times two. There are 14 vertices here. I don't know if this picture is accurate, but think of it as a 14 by 14 matrix, okay? And whenever something is connected to something else, I put a black box. I would have had a one in the adjacency matrix. And then let's just think, if I were trying to get a function on the unit square that described this, what would that function look like? Well, I kind of squint my eyes and I get the thing on the right. If I take a random graph, GNP, that means there are endpoints and each one is connected independently with probability P, in this case, equal to a half, then I get this kind of jumble. And what that converges to in this vague squint my eyes sense, just look at it, is, oh, it's the function that is one half on the unit square course, there are lots of complications. Like what about permutations of the vertices? Okay. Do you Excuse have a question? Okay. There's another question. Is a node connected to self? Uh, you, you can have self loops. Absolutely. In, in principle, you can have self loops. Yes. Um, what we're not doing here is directed graphs. So, you know, we can have things along the diagonal and, but it's a symmetric graph. Um, but what about permutations of vertices? I mean, you know, if I have all these things and they're connected in this way, you know, that is the, the thing on the left is the same as the thing on the right. So what does this even mean? Well, usually when we talk about graphs, we talk about something up to permutations of the, the indices. It doesn't matter if I call the the elements, the nodes on the Facebook graph, Sally or Bob or whatever, right? I can permute those and I still have the same graph. Um, and in a similar way, what it turns out, this is later with a precise definition of a limit. Oh, by the way, whenever you see a B in, in, um, in the references, that's Christian Borgs, my principal collaborator on this, um, the C, Anyway, the first C is me, <laughs> or one of the Cs is me. And the L, I believe, is always Lovas. Um, it's Lotsi Lovas Senior on everything except the last thing I'm going to talk about <laughs> in the end of my second lecture, which is actually Lotsi Lovas Junior. Um, so W, it turns out, is unique up to a measure preserving bijection. So a measure preserving one to one onto map. So I could take W and I get equivalence classes with measure preserving one-to-one -one on two maps. In the case of W equals a half, that doesn't matter. But in the one above, that's a big non-uniqueness. But when I mod out by all measure preserving bijections on the unit square, then 
I can identify a unique element. In the same way as with the graph itself, I could mod out by all the permutations of the index name. That's a, that's a hard theorem because you end up having to deal with sets of measure mm -hmm. theorem, yeah. Somebody said that the slides are not advancing. I, did you mean to stay at this slide or you? Yes, yes, I meant to stay at this slide. Okay, yes. great. Yeah, so I'm just talking about the theorem down there and it becomes much worse <laughs> in the case of sparse graphs. And that's actually what we did with Lati Lovas Jr. <laughs> many years later. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about different notions of convergence. The first convergence notion that we came up with is a manifestly local notion. I'm going to test a large graph, G of V and E, by, so vertex at edge set, by studying maps from a small set of K vertices into V. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, if I have a, a small graph, F, with K vertices, I'm going to say that a map is a homomorphism from this small set of K vertices into the big graph. If it maps edges of F into, it, in, into edges in G, it should be edges in G, okay? So in other words, if phi of F is a subgraph of G, it's not a homomorphism if I take it and I do this mapping, and oh, it's not, you know, it's, it's not a subgraph of G anywhere. Um, and then the homomorphism density is the probability that a random map is a homomorphism. There's also a much easier way of thinking about this random map, T of F and G. Let's say that F is an edge, a very simple graph. So K is two, F is an edge, okay? What is the edge density in the big graph? If F is a triangle, I can be asking, what is the triangle density in the big graph, okay? I can be asking, and, and, and think of this as a dense graph. So there are lots of big triangles extending across any way you represent it. The four cycle graph density, the Peterson graph density, every possible finite graph density. So any finite graph you can think of, what is its density? And now, if I have a sequence of dense graphs, I say that it's left convergent or sometimes subgraph convergent. If all of these densities converge for all edges, three cycles, four cycles, so this sounds like a phenomenally strong notion, right? It's preserving all of these densities, okay? I mean, obviously any finite elements of the sequence G you can throw out because the limit is still going to be the same. But if this converges in the limit, I say it's left convergent. There's another notion which looks manifestly much more global than this, which is what we call right convergence. So what I want to do is I want to test a large graph, G of V and E, by mapping the entire set V into a small set K and considering weighted multi-way cuts or energies. So here's how I think about it. Let's say K is three, and it's representing three colors, okay? And now I'm gonna say, I'm gonna have a J, red, blue, and a J, red, red, and a J, red, green, and a J, blue, green, and blue, blue, and green, green, okay? And I'm gonna take any given graph, and I'm going to count up the sum of these J's over all the edges that are in the graph. So this one, you know, there are no red, red, blue, blues, or green, greens, but there are several red, blues, several red, greens, um, several blue, greens. So I count those all up. I divide it by the size of the graphs squared. And I say that's the energy of this graph. It's kind of the energy. These, these edges have weight. So this is like a statistical physics energy on the graph. And I say that a sequence of graphs, of dense graphs, is right convergence. If this converges for all K, so one body models, two body models, three body models, you know, three species models, four species models, and all 
old J. Okay, so this is like really this very non-local notion of what is the energy of any model on this thing. Okay, so what is a limit? Well, for left convergence, you're gonna see it's a probability distribution on finite graphs, right? Because it's giving me those densities. Right convergence, it's gonna be, the limit is gonna be a set, a collection of these ground state energies because those are converging, right? That was the criterion. So now, to get a little more formal than the picture I showed you, a graph on over a sigma finite measure space, I'm leaving out the sigma, the sigma algebra here. Um, so points and, uh, or a, a domain and a measure is an integrable function, which is symmetric, which is what you would expect in an undirected graph, right? And let's just talk about what the empirical what, what an empirical graph on is. If we go back to this, to these pictures here, let's say wherever I had a black square, I put something of kind of of height one, or I just colored it in. Okay. The, that picture there is the empirical graph on of the half graph. Okay. It's on n by n. So let's go back and look at this definition. Now I'm going to divide. So I have a graph on n nodes. I'm going to divide it into, you know, n squared squares, each of size length one over n. I'm going to set w of g to one on the square if it's an edge and zero otherwise. And I'm going to equip zero one with uniform measure. So any graph is actually a piecewise constant graph on right? It's constant on these blocks of size one over n squared. Now, freeze and conning, I want you to think of W2 as zero for the, for the moment when, when we're talking about this. They actually defined a norm, a really interesting norm on, on graphs, okay? And I'm looking at these graphons, but let's think of a graph for a minute. The freeze conning norm would say, and then I also want to think of that T there as S complement. The freeze conning norm of that graph that I'm picturing on the right, let's say those edges have weights, is the max cut over that, okay? What I'm doing is I'm saying if I separate it out into an S, the green thing, and a, and a S complement or T, the blue thing, what is the thing that gives me the most sum of the edges along there? And that this is basically a, a graph on analog of that, if you think of W of X and Y as representing edges. And then we turn it into a metric by taking the difference of two of them. But the thing I'm showing you on the right is just for one W or one graph. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to let W1 and W2 be defined over different spaces in general. Uh, you know, how would I compare two graphs? And in the beginning, when we were doing this, we were like doing it by hand. How would I compare two graphs on a different number of vertices? What would I say the, the difference is? So I have to find a way of comparing them to each other. And in principle, the, the, the space has to be atomless Borel space, but let's not worry about this. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define the cut metric as the metric over all, taking an inf of this over all measure preserving by bijections. So I take something where I'm looking at the cut metric of the difference between two graphs, but then I'm mixing up the vertices in all kinds of different ways. In the graph sense, I'm doing all possible per permutations, but on the graph on sense, I'm looking at all measure preserving bijections of, of the, the difference. And I'm gonna say, see, we wanted to come up with a metric because you know any of you <laughs> who know analysis, and I assume most of you do, know that it's much easier 
to talk about things if you have a metric, then you can talk about Cauchy sequences and you can really get a handle on things converging. And I say that a sequence of graphs converges to a graph on in this cut metric if the empirical graphons converge in the cut metric, okay? So we take that thing where we were looking at them and they go all over, but then we need to mod out this big, um, like, like the permutations on one side, this big space of measure preserving bijections on the next side. Okay, and so this, this was a project that extended over many years Christian Borgs, me, Lotsi Lovas Sr., Vera Shoj, who is amazing. She is the grand dame of combinatorics. Um, and Kadi Vestergambe, who is also a combinatorialist and wonderful. Um, so, uh, and this actually had two couples in it, me and Christian Borgs and Lotsi and Kadi Vestergambe. <laughs> um, so a sequence of graphs is a Cauchy sequence in the cut metric if and only if it's left convergent and also right convergent. So these things that sound dramatically different, this very local notion of subgraph frequencies converging, this very global notion of all possible model free energies converging, and this thing which has to do with these cuts, they're all the same as each other on dense graphs, which is kind of amazing. And there are some other notions too. Okay, Lovas and, and um, so Lotsi Lovas and Balaj, um, Balaj Zagetti um, said that for any left convergent sequence, there exists a graph on such that the limiting subgraph frequencies can be expressed. As, so there is actually a limit. They used a Martingale convergence for this. I'm later going to show you in the second lecture how this actually follows pretty straightforwardly from Aldous and Hoover. Um, and Percy Diaconis and Svante Janssen and separately Tim Austin in about 2008 said, oh, we can get this theorem, the second theorem from Aldous Hoover. And I'll show you that in the second lecture because then we're gonna generalize Aldous Hoover. Um, and then there are also other notions of convergence besides these three left, right metric that are also also equivalent. So this microeconomical free energy, which is like right convergence, this computer science notion of max cuts and min bisections. There's a combinatorics notion of quotients related to modding out Semoretti partitions. And then there's another notion that we came up with with David Gamarnik, which is a large deviation rate corresponding to the entropy of these things in which we fix not only the vertex, um, the, the, the vertices, but also the edge densities, okay? And so we have all of these notions. So the work with David Gamarnik was, was done a little later. So these dense graphs, these things that a priori seem remarkably different are all the same, which tells you that you've got a good notion, okay? It's not so, so, weak that everything converges to the same graph. It's not so strong that everything converges to a different graph and different notions that you might think about all turn out to produce the same limit. Dense graphs are lovely and wonderful. What about sparse graphs? So uh, this is um, with Jeff Kahn and Lotsi Lovas and with David Gamarnik. Sparse graphs of bounded degree are much more complicated, much more fragile. Okay, so there are notions like the Benjamini Schramm convergence notion, which says I choose a random vertex in a graph and I look at the convergence of graphs rooted at that random vertex as I go out. And they talk about that as being the Benjamini Schramm limit of the graph. We can show that for sparse graphs of bounded degree, Subgraph convergence is the same as Benjamini Schramm convergence. It's strictly um, weaker than convergence of free energies, which is strictly weaker than large deviation convergence. So we lose these, these equivalences for sparse graphs of bounded degree. 
Now the ones we're really interested in are sparse graphs of unbounded degree, like power law graphs or you know, Facebook graph or something like that. Okay, so for sparse graph sequences, the limit is defined previously as zero, the way you normalize it. You know, I divide by v squared. And you know, and and if I I only have little o of n squared edges in there, instead of a constant n squared edges, then the whole thing goes away. And so I'm 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 going to assume from here on in in the two lectures that my sparse graphs are of unbounded degree. So what do I want to do? So Bolabash and Reardon in 2010, and then we did a lot more with um, uh, Henry Cohn and Yu Fei Zhao in 2015. But this idea was already in Bolabash and Reardon. Said, why don't we normalize the graph? Okay, so here's a picture of this em empirical graph on of a given graph. Okay, so this one is just. I'm looking at the height of this, right? And I'm saying, okay, these edges are there and those edges are, and the ones with zeros are not there. What I want to do is that I want to rescale it by the L1 norm, by the thing that was going to go to zero, <laughs> okay? Um, you know, as, as, as we get a sequence. So I want to rescale it. So what am I doing? I'm basically just increasing all these heights. So now something could go up to infinity because it's not just a maximum of one. And we're gonna call a sequence of graphs convergent if there exists a graph on such that this notion is the thing that it converges to, the rescaled graph on. So the thing which no longer is just coloring in one or zero on a, on a plane, but it's, it's now got this third dimension, which is scaled up, which means that this graph on now is no longer bounded <laughs> but between zero and, and one in principle. And this turns out under suitable regularity conditions, um, and I'm not gonna go into them because they get very complicated, but this is equivalent to that global notion of right convergence. So somehow this captures convergence of free energies, which is kind of interesting. Okay, now, I'm gonna do something different than I did the first time. I'm gonna say that something is stretched. So instead of taking the unit square and letting things go up, okay, I'm gonna take my one by one block and I'm gonna make it the entire, these are kind of turned upside down from what they should be. Looks like a lower left quadrant. I'm thinking of it as an upper right quadrant. It doesn't really matter. It becomes the entire quadrant, okay? So what I've done, those should actually look much thinner than the ones on the left, but they don't. <laughs> but the new ones in, in, in the box, I'm stretching the underlying metric. I'm taking my square and stretching it out to the entire quadrant. And I'm gonna say that it's convergent in, in this sense, if, something converges with this stretched metric. And interestingly, a modified version of this, and we didn't have this at first, this is just maybe in the last three years or so, we've gotten that this is equivalent maybe for to a second kind of version of left convergence under suitable regularity conditions. So the under suitable regularity conditions we took care of here, but then we have further stuff on it where you can remove the regularity conditions and that we'll talk about in the second lecture. So the problem is without these extra regularity conditions, mass can disappear up for rescaled graphons or out to infinity for stretch graphons. So you have missing mass at the end. And so you won't even get subsequential con convergence but if we develop these notions of regularity, which were hundreds of pages in the two different cases with two different sets of collaborators, then we are able to, to do this. Okay, so you might say, well, how about doing both? How about if I can find a graph, which can, a sequence of graphs, which converge both 
in the sense where I let the, you know, the weight of the function get more and more, or where I stretch out the underlying metric? And what sparsity could we be looking at? Well, if both of these converge, it turns out the graph has to be dense. And then we know that it's much easier. If either of these, so this is the 2015, and some of these have been published much later than that. That was when the preprints were out. Um, uh, is with Yu Fei Zhao, who's a professor at MIT now. And the 2016 is with Nina Holden, who is um, a, a statistician probabilist at um, ETH now, but she was a grad student. If either of these converge, then GN has a divergent average degree, okay? In the case of dense graphs, it's, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a constant, but in the case of sparse graphs, it still has, it's not like those lattices that we saw at, at first. The advantages of the first are that we can get not only the random graph GNP for fixed P, but a GNP for a PN, which is scaling in some way. So, you know, let's say that I flip a weighted coin where um, the, you know, the probability is uh, one over square root of N that something is in there. Okay. So I'll have like, and so, so the edge set, the mass of the edge set will be like into the three halves. Okay, I can get that, I can get sparse power law graphs. And as I mentioned, it's equivalent to rate convergence. So these free energies are multi-weight cuts under an assumption of uniform upper re regularity. Things aren't going too fast up the spout there. The advantage of stretching is that it gives convergence with very long tail power laws, very long term. It can also be generalized to sparse to sparse graphs so that under this uniform tail regularity that things aren't leaking out, it's equivalent to the stretch metric convergence. And then I think one of the more interesting things too, which is uh, uh, Victor Veitch and Dan Roy, um, uh, they came up with the notion of graph axes, which are not just that function W, it has a couple of additional pieces. And then it turns out we're able to show, and I'll talk about this in the second lecture, that with these two extra pieces, we don't need any regularity conditions because those things that are leaking out are leaking out into different elements of the graphics. The graphics has a graph on and two other things. And so nothing, everything is captured in some way if you have a graphics. And it's work we did later with Victor Veitch, who was um, who was a grad student at the time and is now, he was a postdoc with David Bly. I think he's, he's, he just got a good job. I don't remember where, maybe Chicago. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, non-parametric. So we've got these different notions. We've got dense graph convergence. We've got totally, you know, sparse bounded degree graph convergence, that's, you know, uh, very fragile. And we have these two other notions with rescaling of sparse for sparse graphs with unbounded average degree. Okay, now we're going to do a totally different subject, which is non-parametric graph modeling. Okay, so what is a traditional parametric approach to graph modeling? Going back to Holland, Lasky, and Leinhardt in 83, there is the stochastic block model. What is the stochastic block model? It is, um, it's really just kind of colorings, okay? So given, so, so this matrix P, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose K colors uniformly at random. So I'm gonna take endpoints and they're randomly with some, according to some distribution, um, going to be assigned colors, you know, red, blue, green up to color K. And then 
I'm going to connect I and J. It's going to be a symmetric graph with a probability, which is in this matrix P, of the probability that red is connected to red, or red is connected to green, or red is connected to blue. And then if I want to do this for sparse graphs, I'm going to scale these P's by the target density to obtain sparse graphs. Okay, so a lot of people use stochastic block models, and there's a long literature in the statistics and um, other communities on this. Um, and, you know, people were trying to model graphs with this. A lot of people said, okay, let's imagine a graph as a stochastic block model. And estimating these P's, which are now scaling, they're scaled by the density to get an untrivial limit. What I typically do if I'm trying to do estimation is when I get some data on a graph. What I do is I first try to determine the group labels. Okay, so I try to determine what the what the colors are. Okay, via clustering algorithms or belief propagation algorithms or something, and then I average the adjacency matrix over all edges whose endpoints have colors A and B, okay? And so I say, okay, I, I see this and I look at graphs that have, you know, red, blue, and I see it every, and I average that. Now, the problem with this is that it has unclear stability. In fact, it's often unstable under misspecification. So what this means is that if I'm given some data and I assume that the underlying model is a block model, and I go through this process, I'm going to get values for the parameters PAB or P alpha beta. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, okay, your, your data actually represents a block model with colors, you know, with these uh, odds of different colors being connected to each other. But it might not be a block model, but this process will still deliver that. So it won't tell me, oh, it's not actually supposed to be a block model, okay? Um, so there was an alternative non-parametric approach. In fact, we can come up with two. And the first one I'm calling the inhomogeneous random graph, um, which was the name I think given to it by Bolabosch, Janssen, and Reardon in 2007, although some other people had talked about it, going all the way back to 2002, when people were just saying, how would I, how would I do this if I didn't want to assume a block model? So instead of a matrix indexed by communities, red, green, blue, I'm gonna use a function based on features, which I think of as latent features. So it's just, it's a different way of looking at it. And it's getting closer to the non-parametric statistical estimation or machine learning view of it. So I have a feature space. So actually what's in my space omega now are features. They can, you know, they can be, I mean, if I'm thinking of connecting on Facebook, it can be, everything about me as an individual. It can be my height, my weight, my gender or gender identity, my whatever. It can be, you know, uh, zero or one, do I like this or that? Did I, did, I, did I go to Princeton for grad school or not? Okay, so I got a one there. And just, and it can be con continuous variables too. It can be all of those. So there's an underlying feature space. I don't really know what's gonna make me connect to Bin, okay? Which of my features and her features are gonna make us friends, okay? But it's in this feature space. We just don't know it. We don't understand what the features are. And I'm gonna have a probability distribution and I'm gonna have a graph on, just a function on these things and a target density row in, okay? So what am I? I'm a collection of these features, which means I'm, I'm, you know, so the feature space, I'm in the feature space, but what I am is a collection of features. Jennifer, there's a question from uh, Frank Mars. Can you define your notion of sparsity before the second talk? 
like V uh, to O and square? So the sparse means that um, if I divide through by the number of, if, if, I, if I normalize by one over N squared, okay, um, it goes to zero. So sparse yeah. graph means that, uh, that, sorry about that, that I didn't define that. So sparse graph means, so a dense graph, you're connected to a positive fraction of everybody else and a dense graph I mean, you can only talk about a, 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 a sparse graph. You can only talk about in the limit, of course. I'm I'm not connected to a positive fraction. So if I look at you know a grid or something, obviously as the grid gets bigger, I'm not you know there. Actually, sparsity is such that the density is going to. I mean, it, it the density is going to zero, and the first moment of the density, the 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 degree is also going to zero, okay? In these ones that we're talking about now, and if you look at those conditions down at the bottom, okay, the density is going to zero, the density of connections is going to zero, but the average degree is diverging, okay? So rho is characterizing the density of edges, okay? But I'm not putting that in the function W because I want to explicitly scale it out. So I want to model a graph. Somebody has given me a graph and they said, oh, this is a LinkedIn graph. And um, I want to try to find a graph on which models it. They're not only going to give me W, but they're going to give me the target density row, which I measure by looking at, at LinkedIn. Okay. So I measure like how how, if I look at larger and larger realizations of LinkedIn, how this density is, is varying with, with N, okay? It might be that I'm going like, you know, uh, one over N squared, it might be I'm going like one over root N, you know? Um, if I'm going like N, then rho is going to something positive and I'm, if, if I'm going like n squared, I was going to something positive, okay? So uh, what I'm gonna do, does, does that answer the, the question? I think so, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose x1 through xn according to some, uh, 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 according to this probability distribution. So in, in principle, so I have, so I'm a random point that's pulled back. Oh, I'm a random point that's, you know, five foot two and <laughs> this age and this, that, and whatever, right? And I'm a mathematician and blah, 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 blah. I'm a random point, okay? Ben is another random point in this, okay? We're gonna choose the points according to, to this. And, you know, probably there are more salespeople than mathematicians, okay? <laughs> So Pi is going to say mathematicians are rarer than salespeople, okay, in the population. And then I'm going to connect I and J with a probability, which is determined by this function W, okay? So Ben and I are going to have a probability of connecting based on W is going to tell us, given our features, whether we're likely to connect and I want to scale by by row in, by the observed thing that I've seen in this network. And I'm going to call the resulting random graph an inhomogeneous random graph at target density row. I specified that, and somebody's giving me that data. And I'm going to denote it by gn of row n w. Okay, so w is going to have told me how to make these connections. And the relation to the rescaled convergence, you know, this thing where I made w bigger is that this converges, this thing that we've just talked about converges to W in the rescaled cut metric, if and only if the density is going to zero and the average degree is diverging. So this somehow corresponds to that first kind of limit, this very natural non-parametric approach to try to fit my data is, is looking like it could be characterized by that graph on I got via the first kind of limit. Let me do something totally different. 
And Corona and Fox were the first people to do this in 2014. Um, they looked at a very particular kind of W. They looked at a W which was of the form f of x, f of y. It was a product function, okay? Um, which made things a lot easier. But they had their sigma finite measure space, okay? And they had a graph on which looked like f of x, f of y. It was later generalized by Beitch and Roy, and at the same time by me and Christian Borgs and Henry Cohn and Nina Holden. So here's what we do in the general case. Um, I'm gonna have a Poisson process, okay, of points that I'm drawing. I draw me, I, you know, I draw someone with my features, someone with Ben's features, you know, someone with Frank's features. Um, and I'm gonna draw with intensity t, t times mu. And now I'm gonna connect i and j. So now, because the points themselves are pretty sparse in the beginning, I don't have to rescale by a density. Things are gonna be moving out further and further. I'm gonna rescale with this probability W of X and Y, the probability that someone with my features and someone with Ben's features connect to each other. And then I'm gonna remove isolated vertices and output a finite graph at time T. So let's look at how I do this. I am representing the feature space as one dimensional, but it's not really one dimensional. It's every feature you can think of. And if it's a latent feature space, every feature you can think of of me and of Ben. And according to some Poisson process, I draw you know, me, I'm X1, I draw bin, that's X2. This is not in one dimension, this is in some high dimensional space. I draw X3, I draw, draw X4. I've got four points by time T1. I flip coins, okay, between each pair of points. So four choose two sets of coins, okay? But I, it's symmetric. And and so what has happened is that Bin has connected to Frank and Bodhi, okay? I didn't connect to anyone. All my coins said I didn't connect, okay? I, I drew them with probability so W of X1, me, and the other three points didn't connect when I flipped that W-weighted coin. Now at some time later, T2, I've added three more points and I flipped all the coins. Even though I missed out on the first round, X7 tried to connect to me. And lo and behold, X7 connected to me. So now I'm in the graph, okay? And X6 happened to attach to um, Frank and Bodhi, but <laughs> not to, uh, no, to, to Ben and Bodhi, but not to Frank, okay? And five hasn't connected to anyone yet. Okay, but the graph I output at T2 has, has the six points, X1 up to X7 to lead X5, and it has these edges. And I keep going on. And the relation to the stretched convergence, pulling out that underlying metrics of the square becomes the upper right quadrant, is that it's going to converge to W it, this process, this Poisson process with the flipping of coins with probability W is gonna converge in the stretched cut metric. So this is very related to that process, okay? So that's, I mean, you know, each one of these statements is like 50, 60, 70 page paper. So I'm, you're not expecting, but, there is this stretching of the underlying space. So let me just show you a couple of pictures. <laughs> um, the inhomogeneous random graph, if I generate things, lands up looking something like the picture on my left, which I hope is on your left. <laughs> well, it's labeled inhomogeneous random graph. And the graph on process has things that are much further out, okay? And, and of course, the inhomogeneous random graph, you're not seeing the height of those. Those could have leaked up to infinity if we didn't scale them properly, <laughs> okay? Um, 
you know, in, in height, but this thing on the right, you know, they could be leaking out to, to the end or much more sparsely connected things at the end. So the rest of this talk, I'm gonna work with the first model, but I'm gonna focus on the second model and something called graph axis, which are generalizations of graphons in the second lecture. They contain a graphon and some other pieces. And that's gonna kind of tell us what could be happening with that second process. Okay, so now how do I estimate and do machine learning on this? Okay, well, what I wanna do, I, I just walked in as an employee of LinkedIn and somebody hands me the LinkedIn W, <laughs> okay? Um, or really what they do is they hand me, I wanna hand the LinkedIn W to every new employee. I don't have it yet, okay? <laughs> so I wanna try to estimate it. So I've been tasked with estimating it so that I can hand it out to new employees when they walk in the door. So what I wanna do is I wanna estimate W by the best K block approximation to the adjacency matrix. So what we end up coming up with is a least squares algorithm. So given an input graph with an adjacency matrix A, which is just the matrix of ones and zeros of E of the edge set, um, and an in integer k, I am going to um, basically run over all per permutations, okay? I have to be careful because there are like boundary effects. But basically what I'm doing is I'm taking B, a given matrix, and I'm comparing it to the thing that was handed to me when I walked in which is A, and I was told, you estimate this, okay? <laughs> it's my job for this year at LinkedIn, you estimate this. So I was given A, I'm comparing it to B, but I'm minimizing over all permutations of that adjacency matrix B. And then I'm taking the B, which minimizes this, okay? So I'm finding the best approximation to A mod permutations. I first mod out the permutations and then I find the best, okay? And, um, okay, and I output it, okay? I output the empirical graph line corresponding to this. And I guess this is with, um, okay, so here, here we go. So it's n tends to infinity. So this is with um, uh, Ganguly, who is in my and Ben's department at, at Berkeley um, when he was a grad student, <laughs> okay? So a long time ago, it's just getting published now finally. But as n tends to infinity, the empirical graph on that is so generated with this least squares algorithm gives the best possible block model approximation to W in, in this metric, which is this metric, which mods out all measure preserving by bijections, as long as the W is in L2, the density is going to zero, and the, the density is going to zero and the average, um, average degree is diverging. So here we go, we get these approximations, approximations, approximations. And then I'm gonna estimate a graph on from these approximations. And then I'm gonna say that is actually a graph on on its way to becoming the best approximation to W, assuming W is in L2. It's not in L2, if it's worse than L2, we don't know what to do with this. Okay, that's a pretty big class in, in L2. Okay, so I can estimate it. And then once I've estimated it, you know, oh, you're at Facebook, here's your W. And you're at LinkedIn, here's your W. And, you know, your, um, your uh, 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 communities being, um, uh, being um, studied, 
um, by development, um, development economists someplace, here's the W of your community. Okay, so now I'm going to say, I not only want to estimate it, but I want to estimate it privately, okay? We know that even with databases, never mind graphs, just databases, um, we can violate very easily the privacy of individuals. This notion of anonymization uh, is, you know, is very hard. When someone tells you, oh, I'm giving you an anonymized health data set, you know, if it contains enough information, you probably couldn't anonymize it. It's even worse for graphs, okay? Because others via their connections reveal information about us. So already, you know, going back a dozen years, there was a paper which not looking at the characteristics of any given individual on Facebook, just looking at the known characteristics of their connections was able to, with relatively good probability, estimate your sexual orientation, right? And so this is, I mean, it's much worse than just a database. And we know that naive anonymization, you know, can, can easily be undone. Okay, so we ask, can we do this privately, differentially privately? Adam Smith, who is the S there, is um, one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the inventors of differential privacy in the database sense. And oh my God, what's his name? He's just wonderful. <laughs> He was David Gamarnik's student, the Z there, uh, Zadik, okay? And I think he may even be on the job market right now. He did a postdoc at NYU, um, uh, uh, Ilias um, Zadik, Z-A-D-I-C. He was just fantastic. He was just what you want. We worked with him when he was in grad school. He was incredibly persistent, more persistent than, we, we would have given up on the problem and he didn't. <laughs> Okay, but first we did something uh, simpler with Adam Smith. So a uh, randomized algorithm is epsilon no differentially private. If for all, okay, let's think of what we want. If you include me in the graph or you don't include me in the graph, uh, I don't want anything that you measure on the graph to, to be to, to tell you very much, okay? To, to, to give you a very different answer. Because if it did, okay, then you could conclude something about me. So what you want is you want that this algorithm is such that if you apply it to the graph and you do anything, you look for anything, I look for, average income, or I look for odds that I'm going to have some genetic thing, or I look for, you know, uh, odds that I have children or don't have children or whatever. Um, I, I want, if, if this is no differentially private, when it looks at Facebook with me or without me, it's going to get an answer, which is one plus little o epsilon different. Okay. So that's like a notion of differential privacy for a graph, for removing an edge, I, uh, for, for removing a node on a graph, which is what I really care about, okay? There is a notion for edge privacy, but that's much easier and less useful. That's, oh, if I remove an edge, if I remove that I'm connected to, to bin, okay, that, you know, um, well, that doesn't do anything. <laughs> ben wants to know what happens if she's in the, in the graph or not in the graph and what are people finding out? Or I want to know if I'm in the graph or not in the graph, what are people finding out? I don't care if Ben and I are not connected, what they're finding out because they may still find out something I don't want them to find out from my connections to other people. So most of the previous work had been on individual graph statistics 
or edge privacy or dense graphs. So what we did was we used the so-called exponential mechanism. So here we have an algorithm and what we do is we're gonna put, we're, we're, we're gonna output a sample from the following. We are gonna look at all possible ways of permuting over this, taking an L2 norm, okay? And we're, we're gonna be sampling with this probability, the probability that I see something is gonna be sampled according to this. And can we achieve this? Can I estimate? As I estimated back here, okay, I got a B, but the B I got here when I was told, oh, take LinkedIn and produce an approximation to its W, can I do it without revealing private information? And so I want to do that. Well, it turns out if W is bounded, okay, so it's much stronger than the W being L2. If the density is going to zero, and if the um, edge density, it, the, the, um, the, um, the, the degree density is diverging at least like log n, so a little bit more than just diverging. It has to diverge at least as fast as log n. I can output that for you without revealing any information, which is kind of surprising. <laughs> and the part we did with Ilias and Adam Smith and Christian Borg was that the upper bounds matched, and this was really surprising, the min-max lower bounds in the limit of no privacy. So in other words, we could estimate for an L infinity W, we could estimate just as well while preserving privacy. So that was really interesting, <laughs> okay? Doing the sampling like this, we were able to estimate that. Um, while remaining differentially private uh, and, and getting, and it was Ilias who just persisted and persisted <laughs> to get that min-max lower bound to be the same as it was if you tried to do this the way we had done it with Shoshendu Ganguly without worrying about privacy. There are a lot of people who are working on things that are not unrelated to this now in, in the stats community. Um, you know, uh, what's his name? Harry um, at, at Yale. What is my problem? I'm blanking on Harry's last name. Harry Zhao. Yeah. And anyway, there are various people and their students. There's a, a wonderful work on this in the statistics literature now. Okay, so where are we right now? Okay. We have graphs, they have vertices and edges. The edges are specified by an adjacency matrix. We've learned about different ways of taking limits. We've learned about how to take limits for dense graphs. Many a priori ways, a, a priori very different ways turn out to be the same. We've learned about taking limits for sparse graphs that have um, connectivity of order one. Okay, I'm, I've got like a constant number of neighbors. Um, we've learned two ways of doing sparse graphs where the, um, where the number of connections diverges with n, okay? Not that I'm connected to order one, of the n squared other people, but I'm connected to log n or I'm connected to whatever. It's, you know, the number of my connections is growing as the graph grows, which is what happens in many real world networks. So we've learned all these different things for the sparse graphs. We learned about this way of 
normalizing them so that the mass of the adjacency function increased and regularity conditions to prevent it from going to infinity. And we've also learned about a way of doing it so that we take that unit square, we stretch out the underlying metric, scaled with the L1 norm of, of W in such a way that provided there are some, um, some conditions to make sure that we don't get divergences in the tail, that it doesn't run off to infinity, we, we are able to do it. Give you a quick preview though. What we do in the second lecture is that second way, we find out that if we remove all regularity conditions, but we include in addition to graph on a couple of other things, then the stuff that we were trying to prevent does happen. It's okay for it to happen and it creates some other structures. Okay, we also learned how to um, model a random graph. We learned that there was a stochastic block model, but we could do something like um, something non-parametric, again, in two different ways, corresponding to scaling by the density or corresponding to this weird Poisson process. And we learned that we could estimate these sometimes even privately. Okay, so now here's an application for the last, I don't know, for the last little while. Okay, so I wanna do a recommendation algorithm, okay? So here I have users and I have movies and you know I rate it from one to five stars, okay? And what I would like to do is, oh, and network completion, you know, let's say I'm a development economist or whatever, or let's say I'm Facebook or LinkedIn and I want to suggest people you should connect to, okay? <laughs> and so how do they get these names? Well, they get them by looking at this underlying, um, at the underlying connections and completing it, or you could even do a weighted network completion. So, oh, um, I not only on Facebook want to look at who I'm connected to, but how often I like what they say, okay? And so they're not only gonna suggest to me on the basis of my connection, but like if I never like something for that connection, <laughs> probably don't wanna give me more of that kind of person. If, they, if they're talking all the time and I'm not liking their, their, their posts, you know, that, that would affect. So then I get a weighted or frequency of interaction, something like that. Okay, so this is really a matrix completion problem. Let's think of the Netflix example. So I've got people along the rows. So, you know, here's how I've rated. Sorry to interrupt, Jennifer. I'd like to leave some time for questions. So could you wrap up in like five minutes or something? Yes, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna, um, uh, so these are people and the columns are ratings. Okay, and I wanna find out this missing entry. Well, and I'll talk much more about Aldous Hoover later, but exchangeable and ergodic, which this is, means that I can represent F as some function of the latent variables of the people and the latent variables of the movies. Maybe movie, it's a mystery or a thriller or whatever. Those are some latent variables and people. There's, you know, level of education and what other things they like. And given that I can do that, I can then take an expectation over that epsilon. And what I get is a function W of the latent variables of the people and the, and the latent variables of the um, of the movies. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to observe each entry independently with probability P. There is, in, in principle, I could fill in the whole graph. So it is a dense underlying graph, which is why I could use Al Aldous Hoover, but I don't see all of that because Ben and I haven't seen every movie in the world. We never will. And this is the dimension of the latent space. We can take the max of the two of those. 
So given an observed data matrix, how can we learn that? And ideally, we'd like to estimate for P goes like one over N, a constant degree. I don't want the number of movies I have to rate increasing with that as the number of movies goes to infinity. Chatterjee had previous results where it went like N to the minus two over G plus two, which is not useful. I mean, I'm on a border constant when I multiply by, by N. He, he has to observe too much. So challenge of sparsity, there's no overlap here. I've rated and Bodhi has rated different movies. Okay. But then if we go out, okay, other people have rated the movies we rated, they rated more movies. Oh, wow, there's overlap. Okay, how much overlap do we need? I, I want a boundary of order square root of n by the birthday paradox. So there'll be substantial um, intersection. And when I look at the sampling density, I'm sampling with, with density p. This tells me how far I, I have to go out. This is an easy calculation. And then I'm going to compare product ratings along the paths. I'm going to compare these using graph on representations. And the theorem, which is the final theorem, <laughs> um, is, and, and, and this is with uh, Christina Lee, who now changed her last name. She's at Cornell. Um, and Deborah Frotshaw, who's at MIT, is that um, if we observe like of order d squared over n, okay, then we are going to be able to estimate this thing very well. I'm going to be able to predict for you using this method we came up with of going along the path using a graph on representation. It's much better in the previous result, which could only do that. It allows for general bounded noise graph on estimation. Summary, we did dense graphs. Tons of things are the same. We did sparse unbounded degree graphs. New notions of integrability came up. We're going to be really focusing on that second one. Uh, we also found out how to do non-parametric models, Okay, more than just a stochastic block model. We found that we can consistently estimate those with an unbounded W, and that if W is bounded, we can even do it privately. Okay, and we can get matrix completion algorithms. There you go. Thank you, Jennifer, for this fascinating talk. So uh, let me go to the questions. Jaya has a request for you to share the slides for the next talk before your next talk, so people can take a look. I think it's a great suggestion. Good. Yes, I will, I will make them available, yes. Yeah, so here's a harder question from Philip Kalina. Uh, after applying all this wonderful mathematics, why does Netflix still seem unable to recommend content I would like unless it's similar to something I liked before? I agree very much with that question. I have the same problem with Netflix. Well, I don't know if they are doing, <laughs> if they're using our algorithm, but I do think honestly that they take those things smaller, those paths smaller than they should be, basically, right? If they, so they're not sampling along the path for long enough to be able to recommend other things to you, okay? They, they should be sampling more and then they would get enough that their recommendations would give you some outliers that you should like. That's my guess. Yeah, that'd be nice. I think we all need to see some different movies than what we, <laughs> than what we just saw. Yeah. Uh huh. Any we other? You can't get enough matches on the ones that you don't go out a very long path that they just bring those back to you. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think as long as we subscribe to them, they don't have a lot of incentive to uh, do something <laughs> better for us. <laughs> Any other questions? Well. I don't see at the chat. And there might be some. Were there any on the on the chat? Body is watching. Body, yeah, body already moved to one. So I have one question. So you have this different form of of uh, convergence. I understand that for the graph one, they all reach the same conclusion. I mean limit, but they're different metrics, right? They're not identical metrics. So. Right. 
do, do people know like um, which one is stronger or have people understand order them which one is stronger than others? So, you know, for the dense graphs, you saw what was yeah, yeah, the, first part. The, the sparse, the really sparse graphs, sparse graphs of bounded degree. Um, when these are compatible, <laughs> The, these, these can only be compatible on dense graphs. So it depends whether you are going to want, I think in the end, you're probably gonna like the second notion more because there is a, a very interesting underlying Poisson process. But, um, you know, there are often mutually exclusive conditions on the W's for which these different kinds of convergence will work. I see. Okay. I think it's Except in that. the case of a dense graph. I see. Okay. Thank you. Another question from Kruno Cartry. Is there a connection between these methods and the Netflix price? I guess you kind of said you don't know what they do. Well, I, I will tell you something interesting. So, you know, I, I, talked a lot with Terry Tao as we were doing the uniqueness pieces of this. You know, Terry, um, Terry and Emmanuel Candace, you know, kind of worked on versions of the Netflix. I mean, they thought about it a little bit, right? And there are, um, and some of the things that they were doing with some of their matrix completion, um, these really disturbing mets of, sets of measure zero, that kind of sneak in and prevent you from um, almost prevent you from proving um, from proving that the graphon is unique up to measure preserving by by jackson's. Some of the same questions come in here. Some of the same. I mean, so only in the sense that the way Terry Tao or Emmanuel Candace would would think about. <laughs> trying to do the Netflix prize. Some of the same different measure theoretic questions come in. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the second part is about, are they using some alternative square recommendation? Uh, again, about Netflix? Well, I think they are using something which is, you know, based on finding these, these latent features. I think this product along the paths is, is actually a very good mechanism. And as I was saying in the beginning, in the same way as differential equations make it much easier for you to see things sometimes than the underlying interacting particle system. And then you win big awards for showing that the interacting particle systems are actually converging to the differential equations. Um, in the same way, I think having the graph on is, a, is an easier way of formulating the algorithm. The algorithm would seem really, really complicated if you, and so people might not come up with this, with this um, complicated and, and algorithm if you didn't have the graph on representation, which allows you to just put things in products and do various things. And in a sense, what you're doing with graph on is you're, you're able, you know, when you are able to forget about the lower order terms, okay? And when you're like solving a differential equation, you are forgetting about the lower order terms that, you know, starting with Baradan, <laughs> we worked so hard to show you get the differential equation. Those lower order terms can be important in certain circumstances, but they often don't let you see the forest for the trees, you mm -hmm. know? And in the same way, coming up with algorithms, just saying, oh, so I'm gonna go along this path and I'm gonna have a product along the a product of these W's, you know, is a lot easier of a way to conceptualize it, right? Yeah. And you don't have to go in and control all the errors all by yourself, right? We're telling you under which circumstances those are controllable. So it allows you to think about more, um, complicated algorithms. Yeah. And also I think you make errors in making wrong connection because people are just going to screen it out next step. I think I'd rather them to do more exploration for me. I can screen, right? Because I don't click it. 
and instead of like being very conservative, giving only things. I'll like start sending you recommendations, Ben. How's that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's almost an because hour. I know some of your latent variables. <laughs> yes, so you can tell them do a specialized um, recommendation. <laughs> Yeah. So thank you for a really amazing talk and uh, for all the people putting questions. And let's give Jennifer a big cloud. Oh. And remember the next talk is on Thursday, 4 p.m. Uh, East Day time. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, so thank you for attending. Uh, I appreciate the tenacity of the audience. There was a lot in here. <laughs> There's another one about what library you use to generate a graph on the current slide. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm that that I I copied from somebody. I'm sorry. I just copied yeah. it off the web. I probably violated some. There's there's probably somebody out there who did some wonderful thing, and I'm not properly acknowledging them. And whoever you are out there, thank you, thank you, thank you. I use that all the time. <laughs> Okay. Great. Well, I guess uh, people probably want to move on. Thank you all for attending and enjoy JSM. Okay, great. Bye-bye. So more good comments from the, from mm. the, the chat. Oh, are X and Y under your radicals? No. <laughs> Okay, I missed that. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> well, put, put up the slides because people are asking. Yeah. Let's talk. That'll yeah. be great. Okay, okay. see you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.